even after this, continue the dialogue. Uh, obviously, we have each other's contact information here, but the, the contact and the communication engagement starts now. So, thank you for coming. With that, glad about this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, wow. I'm, I'm thrilled. Anybody else want to take the podium? And then we can continue. Um, all right, so a couple of things. First of all, a bit of uh, housekeeping. I hope nobody has a problem with being live on Facebook because we're about to basically feed it Wendy over there, right? And everybody who has a Facebook account, make sure that you share, okay, and then tag, you know, sorry, sorry shameless self promotion, right? So, uh, okay. So, do we have to friend request you first? Yeah, uh, you won't be able to because I'm maxed out. So, send me a message. Oh. Send me a message and I'll see if I can blow somebody else blow up. Somebody else up. <laughs> Well, I have people that I need to be blown out, so you know, every <laughs> once in a while I'll just throw out some incendiary question, and then the way to answer it, that basically admits them out of the way. So, 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 so be warned, right? No, but okay, so, uh, but please do, and uh, there's an event actually on Design for Success event that we put on there, so again, comment, and you know, I'll, we'll share the video, I'll download that thing, you guys can have it as well. A uh, couple of things, first of all, I think everybody around the room is pretty much either in Probably not pretty much service industry, maybe product, uh, you know, product services, right? Okay, cool. Um, how many people, I, I used to teach, and this is one of, the, one of the questions that I used to ask, a class of MBA students, because I would come back co-in to basically do a presentation for Pepperdine class, and I would say, how many people in the room, so I'm going to ask you guys, how many people in the room think they're creative? Show of hands. Wow, it's a pretty good room. Okay, cool. Right. So the normal answer, if you imagine, executive MBAs, ask them that question, two hands kind of slowly go out of the back of the class. And then you go, okay, so if I had asked you the same question when you were in middle school, how many hands would have gone up? Every hand would have gone up. Okay? So we do a real number on ourselves, right? Perceptions. Fitting in a mold, whatever, right? Somebody was asking me earlier, and said, you know, what do you do? What, like, how do you find something? I said, I don't know. I said, my mother's been trying to figure it out for 54 years, right? So, I don't know. The thing about what we do is, my, grad, my academic background is I have an undergrad in economics. I burnt out at the age of 20 doing a master's in marketing at the Drucker Center in Claremont. And then ended up doing interior design because, basically, my mom came over from Kuwait, Gulf War starts. I'm stuck at home with my mom. I haven't been with her for 10 years in the same household. Love her to death, but I basically need to get out. <laughs> and there was no 73, and I basically got this thing in the mail that said Interior Designers Institute Newport Beach Summer Certificate Program. And I figured I'll just go do arts and crafts for 12 weeks. <laughs> okay, <laughs> life, life's journey. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, pretty much, right? You put the top down on the car and just drive to PCH. Nothing on, uh, in Crystal Cove other than the Shake Shack. And I did that and ended up basically falling into this, and I've been doing it since 94. I've worked for large companies, number one in the world for hotel design, architecture, for seven years I went out on my own and did everything from hotels in Dubai, on the island of Mauritius, anybody know where Mauritius is? Okay, cool. So the island is so small, the ham in Mauritius is already in the ocean. Okay. Um, but it's, a, it's amazing. So creative. Uh, okay, Mr. Creative. When was the last time you bought a piece of furniture? Ah, see so the, wife, the wife's creative. Okay, so, uh, it's a we. Yeah, so you you, you delegate, you, you, but, but you're in a, you're in a delegating business, right? So you delegate the responsibility, All right? The point is this, okay? Most people, and I have this is not the portfolio, but Wendy shook her head at me when I told her this. I have a hundred slide portfolio, additional PowerPoint that you guys can more than welcome to. I'll share it with you if you are interested. I only picked some stuff as a case study. So we can go through it together, right, in limited time. But the point is this. Most people will not hire a commercial interior designer or hire professional services because they think, A, it's too expensive. B, I can do it myself, even if I have to learn. Okay? Now take the interior design component out of it, put your own business description, business category into it, and you tell me how that doesn't apply for you, right? The problem is this. People pay good money, good people pay good money to bad consultancy every day. And how do we know? Because they call us to fix it, right? And they could have done it, like in, your, in the case that you were sharing, Tim, is that had they actually reached out to you beforehand, they wouldn't be looking to being in solitary confinement for three years before they actually can do something, right? So the, I, the, the point is to try to get to people in advance. 
Now we basically can service people all the way from assessment, feasibility analysis. We just did a 33, I designed a 33,000 square foot spa on three barges floating in the water off the Maya Hotel in Long Beach with a circular boardwalk, okay? In order for the company, development company, to find out whether it is something they should pursue. We did a menu of offerings that basically translated to a PL with revenue, op, revenue optimized gener, general possibilities. And basically, based on that, they then went to the next step. How are they doing that? We, we are now at the point where we're trying to get it through the city. I have already talked to the mayor of Long Beach. They're very excited about the project, but there's coastal, there's other things. But this is a major undertaking. That's a Hilton, right? It's a Hilton. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a major undertaking. But we can do that for anybody who's doing a, a mom and pop that's taking a thousand square foot business, going to a 5,000 square foot model because they're growing. They haven't touched their business in five years. Anybody else in this room think the economy is going to turn on us a little bit now? Okay, right. So if you have been riding high on what you have had for the last five or 10 years in any kind of business, let alone a brick and mortar that's customer oriented, okay, you better up your game because somebody's about to take your market share. Okay, and the model of operating a brick and mortar has completely changed. And I'll talk, I'll touch on a couple of things that are sort of disruptive technologies that apply to any industry. So with that being said, design for success really is how to put your best space forward. Okay, and let's go to this. So experiential spatial design, holistic approach to design focusing on user experience. You can apply that to pretty much any industry, right? But most people don't look at design as being that. They look at it as being a decorative aesthetic, right? Nothing that you spend money on, if you are doing a skin or an aesthetic to something, should not have some sort of quantifiable, measurable return on investment, in positive impact on your bottom line. That chandelier in your lobby, yeah, it could be something out of, and it doesn't necessarily not have to be from Lamps Plus, but how you configure it in the storytelling through your space has a direct impact on your success of your business. Otherwise, it's just like anything. How many places have you gone to lately that have recycled wood on the walls? And pretty much you could take a logo off, put somebody else's logo on, and it would equally work as well or as badly. Okay, that's number one litmus test. If you can walk into a space and you can see somebody else's business identity on there, then there's not enough there, and they paid money for not, not good consultancy. Okay? Another thing is we incorporate multiple disciplines. So we work with architects, interior design, graphic, marketing, branding, all of it, because at the end of the day, this is it, the unique value proposition. What is your unique value proposition as a business? Whether it's service or product, okay? And that is your 3D brand when it comes to an actual environment. If you think about packaging, packaging is the identity on the outside of the, of the box. Now, what does that box sit in a backdrop of some sort, a side panel, if you go to a, to, to a store, you have backdrops and vignettes and things like that, that identify that brand. If you go even into an apartment store like Macy's, for example, there's a Ralph Lauren component, there's a Clinique component. It's not just the packaging on the products. There has to be a pitch on the whole, the whole experiential touch to that customer, right? And especially if you're in a tight, confined space like that, where you're in a strip mall or you're in a food court, how do you differentiate yourself? Right? Unfortunately, a lot of people pay for regurgitated consultancy. 10 pages of, here's, here's my deck, here's my, here's my report for you guys, this is what my concept should be. The first cover page is basically got your logo on it, and the last two pages basically have some specifics for you, and everything else in between is regurgitated because that's how I sell paper. Right? That's not what we do. That's, I've never done that. I really don't appreciate that when people do that to people. Three-dimensional branding. That's what we're doing. So branding is not about getting your prospects to choose you over your competition. It's about getting your prospects to see you as the only solution to their problem. You have a toothache and you want to go to the dentist. Do you want the dentist to sit there and tell you about how, where they graduated from and look at my degrees on my wall. And let me explain to you the process of what, how we basically do in, entry and get you into our system and all of that stuff, and then I'll talk to you about what we are going to do. No, you want me? You want to give you something to kill the pain right away. Solution: the only solution to problem satisfaction. You pitch people on that. Don't need to worry about the other stuff. Okay. 
Branded environmental environments leverage the effects of the physical aspects of a space. And again, TI, you don't have an option if you're not building from scratch. You've got to work with what's there. You've got to transfer what you are now working within as, a, as an envelope to do what you need it to do for you. To help deliver your identity attributes, personality, culture, corporate culture, and key messages of your business. Again, if you don't have a clear messaging, if you don't know what the language of your business is, what it is that you that basically is your unique value proposition, you cannot transfer it. So you need to get there before you actually now basically implement that and amplify it through your space. It applies and promotes your brand equity through 3D space. How many times have you ever seen the word brand equity on balance sheet? Never. And yet, if you think about it, how many times do you actually value a space, be it a restaurant or a spa or dry cleaner, because of their brand equity? That has to be consistent from the 5 by 7 ad that I see in the paper all the way through to the follow-up that they call me on. And identifiably different. Use spaces as a medium for the message, for telling your story. Space is no bit different than a book, it's just three-dimensional. It helps your business be defensible, defend, defendable, and sustainable. And if your market turns and you get things get more competitive, if you don't have something that is defensible and sustainable five to seven years, then you have wasted <laughs> money and you're only going to do capital reinvestment. Now, I don't know a lot of companies that have that kind of margin to be constantly reinventing themselves every three years. <coughs> Not to take away from any of the glorified way we look at our, at our businesses, but the bottom line is, if you are in a product or service industry, take away all the layers, <coughs> we basically put on a performance and people applaud by giving us money. That's We don't cure cancer. This is what we do. That's the state. So the stage upon which you perform your business is super critical to the success of your business. Okay, and and the quality of the performance is what they basically then co co come back and see again, or they tell their neighbors to go catch your show. Okay, if you think about it in terms of theater, we may have a sense of what we should uh, facially look like when we're going to a cocktail hour or going to have a meeting. We may even know what kind of clothes we should wear to one event or the other. We may even have a gift of gab or, or some sort of script messaging that we already know that we use, right? right? But how many of us actually think about the environment in which we perform our business as being as critical as that? Be it a car that I drive up to because I'm an outside salesperson or the lobby of my business. One of my clients four years ago said to me when they were moving from one area to the other, said, I want to get more $10 million clients than $1 million clients. I want the person to walk into my office and know that I can handle their business because of instinctively what they see. And that's what we use as a motivation for the concept. And they were not in a food and beverage, they were in a tax, payroll, incorporation business in Santa Ana. So, retail case studies. Now, some of these you will know, I picked them kind of, and if you don't, then I'll explain. But, retail case study. Does anybody know where this is? Yeah. No, this, oh, this, 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 is, this is really good. Okay. Montage we'll Hotel. Be, Montage Hotel. Oh, right. Oh, Somebody, okay. Somebody's paying attention. <laughs> I I, 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 yeah. yeah. So what does that look like to you guys? It's like somebody's really great closet. Right. But is it is it nicely organized? It's cluttered. Yeah. 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 Is it overstuffed? It looks like my closet and I basically need to go through spring cleaning because yeah. I bought too much stuff for the last five years. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay, so this is the montage retail that was designed like this from day one. Now, do most people know where the montage retail is? It's right off the lobby. Right. Not many people do because it's badly located. There's no line of sight to it. When I walk in, I literally walk into this wall and behind this is the front desk. There's no line of sight to customer entry, a uh, greeting. All these shelves all these columns, these things are two feet deep. And if you go to the montage, because it still looks like this, go in and put your hand behind that those, those products on the shelves. You will realize that the back 12 inches of the shelf are, are empty. So somebody built two foot deep shelving and only they only use, but who's gonna carry inventory 
that fills all that depth, right? And that's inventory that I don't sell because it's a resort environment. So really nicely detailed, lousy business positioning. Mm -hmm. Yet, they make a ton of money on this thing every year, okay? So, they came to us and said, well, I don't know what we're gonna do, what can we do? So, this next one is the floor plan. This is the current floor plan, I'm sorry it's fuzzy, but the point of it is, see where the black squares are? Mm -hmm. Those are structural. Everything else is non-structural. And this is the stairwell, so you're coming in from the lobby this way and going down to the loft restaurant down here. This is the wall. This is the front desk is here. So I walk in, there's a wall right in front of me. That's my, my greeting first impression, right? What we propose within the same envelope is this. Taking away everything that we don't need. And now you can basically compartmentalize retail and zoning. You have a straight line of sight to the front door and which we did not propose but that added layer what we could do is we could take this wall out and make it glass as you go down the stairs and now my line of sight as i walk in through the lobby is i realize there's actually retail in that corner and everybody goes down to the loft so everybody's going to see all of this glass versus just this which is what they see now okay and then we did these. The thing about this is if you think about a high-end store, it's not about 15 purses on the shelf. It's about one highlighted with a spotlight. Because the price point and value added impression is boom, right? This is a montage. And yet the montage is happy and satisfied with the retail as it is versus something like this. Now, this was five years ago. They still have not done it. That's what I was going to ask you is what happened because it still looks like that. Mm -hmm. right. Corporate corporate mindset, I don't know. But this is, and this this was where we'd be, we'd be glass basically towards the stairs. Also, if you notice, there's actually natural light. There was a windows in there that are buried behind the walls. So did you stage this in your in your business? Did you create this We did this, this model? We, we did this modeling for them. We do renderings. The thing why I'm showing you this is this is a perfect example where somebody had a plan. Do you have a business client or somebody who's basically wanting to invest in something <coughs> prior to them basically going through that exercise, even though they may not have a specific <coughs> lease location in mind, we can actually provide them the equivalent of a funding package. And it has visuals with it that when I basically am giving my P&Ls for somebody to give me the money to basically invest in this or going to a bank, I actually now have visuals that go with what it is that I'm presenting and not just numbers on the table. Right? And we used to do this when I was with, with large with large firms. We used to do this for Hilton, Hyatt, you know, private boutique hotels. People needed to do this. We, I just shared with you the, the thing with the, with the Maya Hotel. That's Ensemble out of Long Beach. They're one of the largest developers. They're the largest developer in Long Beach. Okay. Um, and then here's another shot. So when I come in that door, this is now my impression versus the one that, that we had before. This is the opt-in, or the projected opt-in. By eliminating the unnecessary elements to recapture 20% additional merchandising space within the same footprint, the current store revenue projections is another $150,000, $200,000 a year. So, again, not take away from the loftiness of what we do, but the answer, the answer is, is money. What was the question? Um, um, what was the question? Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine told me that one time, and I'm like, you just burst my bubble. You took away all this esoteric things that I do. The answer is money. What was the question? The bottom line is they don't care what the paint color is on the wall. They care about the fact that this can be done. Now, can they get the aesthetic? Absolutely. That's where the skill comes in. But you still got to provide them with something that could last. Now, at least they were done five years ago. If you walked into that space today and it looked like that, you'd never think it was out of date. But yet you walk into the space the way it looks and should have never been done from day one. This is a spa case study. So this is, you might not know this, this is the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills on Doheny. For seven years, they angst internally about whether they should turn a guest bedroom into a manicure, pedicure suite, which they don't have at the Four Seasons in Beverly Hills. Okay? Now, it's not uncommon. That building was built in 98. They didn't even have a spa. So they notched out an area towards the pool deck on the fourth floor, made that a spa, and then basically they never really had a room to put in a separate nail salon. So, taking one room, 
exact same footprint. The only thing that moved is this wall moved up. Repurposing the, the utilities in the bathroom to a utility sink and, and storage area. We turned this room that generates $500, $600 a night into one, two, three, four, five, six revenue generators, two manicure stations, four pedicures, and two waiting chairs. Okay? I'll show you what the results are in a minute. But basically, we took a space that is occupied once a day and out of circulation and turned into something that could be turned over, over, and over, and over during the course of the day. Okay? They still weren't concerned that maybe it doesn't work. So I actually had to keep this bathtub in place and put a storage cabinet on top of it, just in case they need to turn it back into a room later. Wow. We did boards and computer-generated renderings from the bottom. Now, I want you to pay attention to this, because that's computer-generated, right? That's the actual room. Oh, so you see exactly what you're going to get, exactly what you're going to put money towards or request into your next budget before you actually commit. There's some other shots of that. There's the results. By changing the normal performance, uh, performing space to a much needed amenity, we increase the potential to use same square footage by 300% if operated at half capacity and possibly 1,000% because it can now be rented as private parties too. Mother daughter, bridal, hospitality case study. That is, those are the renderings, and I, I, I will find the picture that I can send to you, but basically, this is the, the, the Monarch Beach Resort down in Dana Point. Now, they spent $21 million renovating the place when it changed ownership, and they unflagged it from St. Regis. They didn't spend one penny in the locker rooms. They built a whole new spa around the existing locker rooms. Didn't change one thing in the locker rooms. Good idea? Oh, yeah, it saved money. Bad idea? Yeah, because you're basically our whole membership-based, and everybody who lives in Ritz Cove and, and Ocean Ranch or whatever, or, um, sorry, Bear Brand, they're basically members there. They're using those facilities every day. And you you basically are looking at a bleeding. They were bleeding membership. Because now they were not only walking through an old hotel to old locker rooms, they were walking through a new hotel with $21 million spent to old locker rooms that have not been changed for 20 years. <laughs> that not only am I changing, putting stuff in the lockers, I actually am invited to use the jacuzzi, the steam, and the sun. Black marble, dark brown marble, nothing. So this is what we proposed. Not one piece of tile was changed in our renovation because they didn't have the budget for it. So we still were able to update. We then were asked to basically tie that look into the uh, fitness area. The fitness area when we started was nothing but white drywall. This is what it is now. Again, money generating. This is not just, you know, feel good. Oh, yeah, I'll send the money. This is the pool deck or the spa. This is what the concrete looked like around the pool deck when we started. This is what we gave them. Oh, cool. And that's just paint color on a deck. Mm -hmm. That took me probably 10 minutes to design and pitch and sell. And yet, I didn't even know that their existing furniture and the colors of the existing furniture work even better with my concept than the color palette that they have for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those, those umbrellas are not something we specify. They just happen to be what they use. Um, this, then we did the stairs leading to the restaurant. And the only thing missing in here when these photos were taken is that we then added, added these stainless steel with orange wings, monarch butterflies on the stairs as well to, again, brand this facility with it. Okay? They had, they had those chandeliers. The origin, The person who designed it first proposed nine chandeliers at $50,000 for the cost of the chandeliers only. Okay? They looked like every single bubble chandelier you've ever seen in every retail location. And I said, that's crazy. And they were small. So we upped the size. We went to hand-blown glass, unusual uh, texturing from Italy. We went to five of them instead of nine. And we cut the budget on the purchase cost of the chandeliers alone by $25,000. Mm -hmm. 
I'm almost there, so I do. So this is the outcome, I think. No, sorry, this is a repeat slide, never mind. Okay, so here's the thing. Why do you care to do that? Well, there's additional pressures happening on the industry and whatever it may be, right? You got small specialized pop-ups in every single industry, whether it's the guy in the pop-up tent that's basically selling insurance, or the person who is now basically moonlighting in their own massage room in a solo salon, right? And everything in between. So small lease, you're carrying a 5,000 square foot lease every, every month. Here's somebody that's basically paying $1,000 basically a month and they're not in a long-term lease. How are you competing with that person? Well, because you have a space and it doesn't really make any sense. What, what is the added layers of service experientially that you're giving me that I'm gonna to go to you versus them? Otherwise it's a price point competition and price point competition is a slippery slope. The minute you go down that thing, mm -hmm. it's only a matter of time. Scalable flex spaces, WeWorks. Mm -hmm. Here, mm -hmm. I gave up my office in San Clemente because I was paying $700 and never there. Now I hang out at the bar at the center club. <laughs> I meet everybody else that's in this room. Third thing, on-demand services. And if, how many people know about this? Soothe? Okay, two people only. Okay, yeah, exactly. Soothe, come to you. Oh. I presented a similar presentation to the International Spa Association that is probably about, the, the conference is about 3,000 people. In my presentation, I had 75% owner-operator spas, day spas, medical spas, and 25% resort. And when I said this thing, not one hand went up in the room. And I had probably about 60 people in the room. This is an on-demand, on your time, download the app, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Because within an hour of when you want the service, you can get it. It can come to you wherever you are. You can pick out of four massage treatments, including prenatal and sports. Sport you can't get anywhere. Prenatal, if you're pregnant, I don't know why you want to get in the car and go anywhere. Right. So they have 50% of their offerings that are unique enough to have a niche, right? You can pick your the, the sex of your therapist, the length of your massage, and now you can actually join, as of a few months ago, you can join on a membership for a monthly, right? It's price competitive with an N, spy and V, and it comes to you. And if you haven't had a massage where you basically say bye-bye and you go to sleep after in your own space, you don't know the experience. And the fact that I don't have to book it like a hair, hair appointment, you know, can you fit me in in a week? Mm -hmm. I can actually get it in an hour from when I want it. Oh, you know, I had an appointment, it canceled. I don't have anything for three hours. I really would like to get a massage. Okay, boom, on the app, gone, done, right? This is the kind of stuff, this on-demand service is happening for everything, everything. So if you are actually a brick and mortar or in business and you don't have something that is unique to your environment in terms of experience, in terms of service, in terms of flow, in terms of offerings, with retail on in your, in, in your shelves, you're in deep trouble. Here's the additional services that we offer in-house or via strategic partnerships. You name it. Operational planning, market studies. So, I said I was an interior designer, right? You see the word interior designer around there? Right? That all of these are part of that holistic, vertically integrated offering. And every single one of these is a point of entry potentially for leads. Either from us to one of these professionals or from that professional to us because they're adding value to their clients by bringing us on board. We talked to Celebrity Cruise Line the other day. They're trying to revamp their whole approach to their spas, whether they should bring in operations in-house or still lease it out to other people. Well, you tell me, who's the best person to do your, to your, do your business? Yourself or some other hired gun? yourself, right? In an, in an environment and in an, in an economy where you are your brand and you have to be consistent, handing it to somebody else who really doesn't care other than the fact that they're doing it and they're doing it the same management service for another five or 10 people, you get the diluted outcome. Ideal strategic partners, potential introduction. Commercial real, real estate brokers, residential real estate brokers, because we're also aging in place. We, we go into people's homes and modify them so they can stay in them longer meaning that their asset now is leverageable for another five or 10 additional years. Um, business brokers, general contractors, branding, marketing, graphic artists, business owners, I mean, a whole list of things. And if you can't figure out how our services would be relevant to your client, call me, give me two minutes, I'll tell you how they're relevant, okay? So he's shaking his head. So what value is design? Every dollar spent on design 
And I quoted myself, so basically, I'm, I'm going to say this is accurate. <laughs> Prove me otherwise, right? But every dollar spent on design yields twenty dollars in increased revenue and four dollars in increased profit. Now, shift the numbers around if you want, but there is definitely a correlation between good design and increased profit. Any way you cut it. If you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Any questions, let me know. We can answer.